today. California Democrats want your children to be vaccinated without your consent. That is no surprise. Uh, Trump speaks on Ron DeSantis and whether or not there is a problem brewing between the two of them. And The New York Times refers to women as menstruators. We've got all that and more coming up, and it all starts right now. Welcome to the News and Why It Matters. Happy Friday. I am Sarah Gonzalez. I see I'm saying happy Friday. Does it is it coming through oh, that I feel happy. very happy? Mm-hmm. Okay, good, good. I'm joined by Stu Bergier, host <laughs> of Stu Does America. Uh, thank you for being here, Stu. In your lovely zip up yeah. Blaze Media. You they, can, they gave us free swag, so yeah, it's it. great. You yeah. can find it at shop.blazemedia.com. You're welcome, management. Also joined by uh, John Doyle, Blaze TV contributor and uh, host of Heck Off Commie, and also you can see John Doyle uh, and myself later tonight right behind me on the You Are Here set. This is true. We're all very excited for that. I mean, you expressly mentioned that you were excited to not be doing just one show today, but two shows today yes. on a Friday, too. Yeah, yeah. Well, John always accuses me of not working very hard, so <laughs> I'm trying to change I would. That. That's the opposite of true. <laughs> <laughs> There's nothing I love more than a girl boss is my favorite. Oh, yeah, I know. I know. You're all about the women who work. Uh, all right, so <laughs> let's get into the story coming from California. Uh, California Dems put forward a proposal that would allow children over the age of 12 to receive vaccinations without their parents' consent or even their parents' knowledge. Uh, This is Bill SB 866. And, um, you know, they say this, uh, they, oh, here's one part of it that I'd like to point out, too. Uh, They they have a caucus that is called the Vaccine Work Group Caucus. (laughs) (laughs) in California. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So they so they formed this caucus, they say, to handle all of the misinformation surrounding COVID-19, which I'm sure in California, this caucus is just unbelievably scientific and factual, all of the things that they do. But um, yeah, they want to make sure that uh, children 12 or older uh, do not need their consent uh, of their parents to receive any of these vaccines. They say approved by the FDA and recommended by the Advisory Committee on Immunization Practices of the U.S. Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. Um, So it's not just COVID, right? It's the flu shot, it's the the polio, chicken pox, measles, uh, any of them they would be able to get if this pass if this passes without their parents even knowing what could possibly go wrong i don't know i can't think of anything <laughs> yeah. um i had this crazy idea that parents should be able to parent their own kids excuse me uh, i know it's it's just like Can you it's, say that on air i know i know <laughs> we're gonna lose the youtube he's channel a, he's about to be canceled so. Uh, so all the good you did with mentioning the zip up uh <laughs> yeah. jacket here is now gone because we've lost our youtube channel uh you know look this this goes to Abortion, which the, the left tries to throw this through in state after state after state, where they mm-hmm. say, hey, yeah, kids can go get abortions without their parental consent. Um, it goes to uh, medical treatment. They, they want a world in which parents are not able to pass on their values and their principles to their children. Uh, it goes, you know, Hillary Clinton famously wrote a book, It Takes a Village, right? Like this is a foundational belief of the progressive left going back, you know, 100 years. And I mean, it's creepy and it's weird, and it's, uh, it, but it's not surprising at this point. Yeah. This is what they've been trying to do, and they've been trying to do this, you know, recently with the sort of like constant war footing of a pandemic. You can push anything through in a right. pandemic, right? I mean, it's like a, it's Make like a war. Make people scared, and you we, can yeah. exactly you can push anything yeah. through. So they're trying uh, this this playbook yet again. The American people hate it, though. Like, you know, look at what happened in Virginia, right? Like they. They want to be involved in their kids' education, right? And this is another version of that. You can't be involved in your kids' health care. You can't be involved in your kids' uh, reproductive rights. You can't be uh, involved in their kids' education. This is all, like, the left is always shocked when people recoil from it. They don't mm-hmm. understand. It's so ingrained in their philosophy. But the American people, and including people who vote Democrat, hate this crap. Yeah. Nobody wants this. Yeah. I want to, John, I want to, I want to hear what you have to say, but I do want to throw in here because I think this kind of goes along with the conversation that we're having. There was a clip that went viral on Twitter uh, from MSNBC. This is, um, what is her name? Melissa Harris Perry. Melissa Harris Perry. Thank you. That's a much, Mm -hmm. 
I didn't realize that Melissa you could. Melissa Hertzberg. <laughs> That's great. Yeah. Uh, and she is on MSN. What is this, like an infomercial? It was a, it was a promo. They were, and This is how I know I'm getting old. Like, I remember covering this story when it went viral the first time. Really? Yes, in 2013. It was kind of a big, you know, talk radio story for a few months um, because this was a big uh, rollout of an MSNBC campaign. And I think it was called Lean Forward. And we were always That's joking right. about it. It's like, lean forward. What, you lean forward far enough, you just fall on your face, yeah, which is yeah. basically what they were advocating at the time. But they had a, a bunch of these with all their hosts, most of which are either uh, no longer on the network or no longer with us, sadly. Uh, but uh, they had all these where they would kind of profile their little view of the left and, and, and w where we should be going as mm -hmm. far as news coverage and culture. And this was Melissa Harith Perry's uh, yeah. version. Yeah, so this is, uh, this is, the, this is her assertion, very, very scary assertion here about uh, ch children and who they belong to, watch. We have never invested as much in public education as we should have because we've always had kind of a oh. private notion of children. Your kid is yours and totally your responsibility. We haven't had a very collective notion of these are our children. Right. So part of it is we have to break through our kind of private idea that kids belong to their parents or kids belong to their families and recognize that kids belong to whole communities. Once it's everybody's responsibility and not just the households, then we start making better investments. Oh. oh. Oh, okay. That's really weird because I... It, so is the whole community in the bedroom when the child is being conceived or... That's a requirement, yes. Is it? Yes. Okay, that's, uh, yeah. yes. that's a whole new level of weird that we're going to have to dissect here. Uh, John, your thoughts? There's always going to be, I think, some authority like in a child's life and it just, you know, is it going to be the parent's authority or is it going to be the state's authority? And they'll market it like, no, it's just, you know, the child, they can make their own decisions now. And it's like, no, but those decisions are going to be defined by the state because the state is running all of this propaganda. And when you're young and your mind is very malleable, that's what you're going to kind of outsource your like view of the world to if it's not going to be there in your own household. But we've always known that they've wanted to basically take kids away from families because the only way that you can really have a total like state to society is if you achieve a state of like total atomization between individuals. And I think a lot of times on the right we fall into this false dichotomy between like individualism and collectivism. And I think there's somewhere in between that, like unity. Like we used to have unity in this country and we didn't require, you know, this big collectivist state to come in and usher in stability because nobody knows who each other are anymore. But now I think we're approaching that point where the family structure's collapsed. Nobody, well, people are still going to church, but people don't like talk in church. They can't even do like, you know, the sign of peace because of COVID and everything. And so we've approached this place where nobody feels like they have anything in common with anybody in this country anymore except for maybe that they all have nothing in common which is like the only thing they have in common it's like this anti-culture and so people are so starving for like some semblance of unity that then when the state comes in and says we can all be unified with our democracy and our values and this is who we are people are very willing to go along with that even though it's completely destructive to the country in the long run yeah, it also really feels like they're just, even, Stu, you mentioned Virginia, you know, I mean, parents, obviously, you would think that if the left was paying attention and was able to course correct, I don't think that they are able to ever do that. But if they were able to, they would. It does seem instead that they're just saying the quiet parts out loud because it's not just... Could you say her name again, please? Melissa Harith Perry. Thank you. That's really a spot on. <laughs> yeah, it's, uh, it's not just her. It's also that, John, you and I were on uh, You Are Here last week, and we talked about that article that was like children, sh like literally parents should just give up their children to the state in the name of equity. And the state could then trade the kids. Uh, the poor kids would go to the rich parents and the rich kids would go to the poor parents and the state would have the authority to be able to spread all of this equity out. And we really spent a little bit of time like, is this satire or is it not? And it wasn't, but it's like, they're really saying the quiet parts out loud now. They do it with that and like when, you know, oh, if we just put the poor kids with the rich kids and the rich kids with the poor kids and everything would equal out. They do right. the same thing with like education spending. Right. Like, oh, the reason that like kids in rich districts do better is because they have more money and kids in poor districts don't is because they don't have money. Because this all gets back to like this Lockean idea of like the blank slate. Like they really believe that like everybody is the same and if there are differences between people, it must be because of some environmental circumstance or oppression or something. It's like maybe kids in richer districts do better because the parents made more money because they're smart and that's why they have more money and can send their kids to nicer schools like maybe there's something more to it than just like you know people like hoarding resources and right. keeping it away from other people but they don't want to have an or honest not that discussion they're smart, about but they're it. invested yeah right like they're invested in their own personal growth they're invested in their children's growth therefore the children will do better yeah and if you have an honest discussion about it 
then you kind of would start to call into question like why we're creating so many new like administration jobs at these schools or why we're spending so much money on teacher salaries despite like declining test scores. So they don't want to do that because it just makes them a lot of money to, you know, speak in these basic talking points about how, oh, things could be so nice and, instead of actually making them nicer. Yeah, it's true. Uh, you know, one of the interesting things I think that goes back to the, the clip of Melissa Hearth Perry, um, she is, you know, kind of forgotten now. She was on TV at, in that era and she, she's really came from an academic background. She was kind Kind of, kind of one of these like 16, 19 project types that was super, super mega liberal, kind of hung out in academic circles and then wound up getting a gig at MSNBC for a relatively short time. And, and she made some news at the time because she was, you know, kind of like Joy Reid, like really far crazy left. And she would, she would pop up on conservative media a lot because she was saying the quiet part out loud. Right. And I think what's interesting about that clip in particular is like that is th just the immense confidence she yeah. says it with, as if it's an obvious thing that how come we haven't thought of this before? Why haven't we just taken parents out of the picture? <laughs> we don't need them. And then MSNBC decided that was a clip they wanted to put forward as the face of their network. This is a major corporation who just wanted to say, yeah, parents aren't really a thing anymore. Let's be honest about it. it, it what it shows is these are the conversations they have all the time. Mm -hmm. When you go on MSNBC, you say something like that, it's not controversial. No one pushes back. No one says anything. Of course we're going to get eight-year-olds vaccinated behind their parents' backs. Obviously, it's what we're supposed to do. It's so clear to them all the time because they live in that bubble and they don't, they don't mingle outside yeah. of it, right? So they don't see what a normal, I think, so I have people, you know, friends who are, you know, on the left or maybe in, in the middle who might even, you know, didn't like Trump and maybe even voted for Biden. But they see this as offensive, right. maybe not as offensive, but almost as offensive as we do, <laughs> uh, where like, you know, this is like out of the realm of, of the very basic foundational human idea. Mm -hmm. You know, the nuclear family is not a conservative concept, but more and more in America, it is. Yeah. We've now been able to, uh, you know, somehow uh, become the only ones who are advocating for it, which is just a bizarre place to be. It really is. It goes to show, too, how in the last 10 years or so, this has accelerated to the point where now, like, everything is politicized. And even MSNBC, which is supposed to be, like, obviously they're going to be, you know, biased towards the left. Uh, I think, what was that? Uh, or maybe that was CBS, that old Bernard Goldberg book. Uh, about, was, yeah, I think it was, was, he was he CBS. Was CBS. Yeah, yeah. But MSNBC has always tried to be, you know, at least nominally somewhat in the middle. And I mean, even in like 2012, they had guys like Pat Buchanan employed there on like mm -hmm. primetime television. And this is the guy who, you know, wrote Death of the West and all these things. And then they kicked him off. And now, 10 years later, you look at like where the network is to where they're now just straight up like, hey, here's the what we're about. And it's about taking kids away from uh, families mm -hmm. and, and making them for communities or something. Like they're like this commodity to be like traded like Pokemon cards or something. <laughs> <laughs> that actually might be more convenient than having children if they were just Pokemon cards. Pokemon cards do not keep you up all night, I'll tell you that. Yeah, the left, that's what I was thinking. I, I thought of this the other day, and I would. I don't know if Pokemon cards were after your time. Wow. I'm, I'm, I feel very personally attacked. Yeah, no, I, kind of, I remember them from back in the day. My kids are into them, though. I mean, yeah. Even, yeah, they, they have, yeah. there's they, a read. They've had a long run, yeah. long run Pokemon Thank you cards. very much. Well, they've had the a reason, long enough run that we know what they yes. are, John Doyle. The reason I bring it up is because I'm sure you guys are will be familiar with this, having spent uh, lots of time arguing with the left. You know how they always defer to, like, do you have a source for that? Do you have a study for that and yeah. things like that? And they reject the idea that you could have a source and then, like, infer your own conclusion from it. They yeah. literally want yeah. you to, well, that's not what the, the title of the article says. How can you know that? You're not an expert. And so I was thinking about it. It's like they literally view, like, sources like Pokemon cards, like, battling them. Like, is it, well, here's my source, and it's yeah. this power, because it has this peer review and this citation, and it's from UCLA. Yeah. And it's like they don't actually <laughs> interpret it or read it themselves. They literally just look at the number and, like, oh, that means it's credible or something, and, like, throw it at you as if it's an actual argument or something without any, like, you know, know, additional mental mm -hmm. computation on their behalf. That is a great point. Uh, all right, we've got more to come, but let's go ahead and uh, take a quick break. We want to thank our sponsor, Built Bar. So if you like a good snack, maybe you have a sweet tooth and you're always like, oh, I need to go to the pantry, but you get in trouble because you're eating candy bars or other things that you should not be eating that will expand your waistline, that is where Built Bar is here to save the day. They've got uh, a ton of different flavors. It's a protein bar, but it tastes like you're eating a candy bar. Um, I'm obsessed with them. Stu's wife is obsessed with them. Oh, yeah. They're amazing. I think she was like the, the one who found it. 
Yeah, she's like the founder of the company, basically. <laughs> <laughs> like, not really. There's no conflict of interest. He's joking yeah, in true. that regard. Barely, but yes. But, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but, I mean, she she was one of the OGs, and I'm so glad that she found it and turned us all onto them because they really are amazing. They're low-calorie, they're high-protein, uh, they're low-carb, low-sugar, high-fiber, and they taste like you're cheating on your diet. You can go to Built.com, use promo code NEWS15, you'll save 15% off of your order. Go over there and get a mixed box. You can figure out which flavor you like and stock up on them. That is promo code NEWS15 over at Built.com. Uh, Donald Trump, you know, he has he's been making the rounds. He's been doing some rallies, uh, but he's also been kind of it's he's had this weird, uh, tense relationship. Some may say lack of relationship with Ron DeSantis lately, For, according to the reports. Right. All the reports are like, oh, Trump is mad at DeSantis and DeSantis and Trump aren't speaking. And um, I think a lot of it is media trying to start uh, a battle that doesn't actually exist yet. And I think a lot of it probably is Trump's ego. Um, but uh, apparently Donald Trump was uh, asked about these reports that he has a problem with Governor Ron DeSantis. And I think we have a clip of Trump talking about this. Watch. Let me ask you, uh, a friend of mine was with the Florida Governor Ron DeSantis the other day. and. Uh, had a private conversation, but he didn't. He said he didn't. Have, it wasn't confidential, and he asked if any of this, if there's, if there is any conflict or bickering between you and him. And he said absolutely not. He said it's total BS. Is he right? Well, he is right. I get along great with Ron. Ron was very good on the Mueller hoax. He was, uh, he was right up front along with Jim Jordan and all of the rest of them. They were fantastic. The Republicans really stuck together, and it was a great thing. And Ron was one of them. And Ron wanted to run, and I endorsed him, and that helped him greatly. And uh, he went on, and he's done a really terrific job in, in Florida. And I think, you know, Ron has been very good. He's been a friend of mine for a long time. It's totally fake news. I think Ron said last week, he said it very publicly, he says, the press is never going to get in the middle of my friendship with Donald Trump. We're not going to do that stuff. And he said it very strongly. I thought it was very interesting, actually, and very nice. But he said that, and I agree with him on that 100 percent. No, I have a very good relationship with Ron and intend to have it uh, for a long time. Uh, I'm trying to find this. I know Wendy Rogers over in Arizona uh, was one of these creators of this drama that does not exist. And she was she was tweeting. Uh, here it is. It says Trump would mop the floor with Governor Ron DeSantis in 2024, including in Florida. Take a lesson from Mike Pence. Hero to zero in less than 24 hours. DeSantis needs to get on board with President Trump now or will be seen as a Benedict Arnold and his political <laughs> career will be over, which I was like. Okay. Who's creating the conflict here? Yeah. Trump, as far as I know, there's been no official like 2024 campaign announcement yet, mm -hmm. right? He's obviously alluded to it. All signs point to that he is running, but there's been no official statement. So why would Ron DeSantis be like, yeah, I'm totally on board with this, uh, you know, nomination, this candidacy <laughs> that doesn't even exist yet? That just it wouldn't be a smart move for anyone in the political world. So the idea that he's going to be seen as a Benedict Arnold, I'm just like, you guys, you got to stop. Yeah. you got to stop. And here's something that I think some people do lose sight of here. Benedict Arnold was a traitor to the country, I know. not to a guy. Oh, no, 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 no. I think she knows that. Yeah, I, well, I know. I think I, I, That's sad, too. I, it, maybe I'm stating it wrong, but it's like... That there's a big difference, right? right? And right. like I think some people get think that that should change, and it should be a fealty yes. to okay. Trump being the yeah. only line. Yep. And, and it's yep. like, look, the guy was president of the United States. You should never be addicted to a politician. You should never you should never put your faith in a guy. Yeah. You know, that, you're always going to be willing to be let down. Um, look, you know, I, I don't believe a lot of the hype with this sort of fight, but but I think it is. It's important to acknowledge that, like, first of all, Donald Trump, if he wants the nomination, it's basically his. If he decides to run, I'm going to be very surprised if he loses. He's at, you know, 70 some odd percent in polls, even against DeSantis and Pence in the same race. Do, now, I, he, I, I, there is a, a, maybe a little bit of fade among the base uh, on some issues. Do you find it? Hold on. Do, mm -hmm. do you find that to be odd? I just find it to be odd, though, because it's like. But why is it like that when he just <laughs> lost? I, right. Did, like, he, it's what not, did he lose? <laughs> 
Well, well, I'm pretty sure he's in. I know Florida, what you're saying awful, here, John Doyle. Amount of time. So it, whether what, no, regardless of how he you you know he lost or whatever, he was in the Oval Office for four years, um, right, and and he's no longer there. It right? just yes, it just um, seems weird that it's like well, it's his to take if he wants it. It's his, to, it's his to take the primary if he wants it. Well, I'm not I saying know. he would win the election. No, 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 you know, no. I know. It, it just, easy. It just seems weird. It's like he just went through all of that, and he is not the president, although he ran and was our nominee, and now it's still up. It's still his if he wants it. it I don't know. It just seems weird to me. I think it is weird, and I'm not saying that it's the correct call. Yeah, I, yeah. You know, I, but I mean, do you disagree with that? I mean, I, do no, you, I don't. If disagree Donald with Trump you. announced tomorrow that I he just, was running, he would at least walk into that nomination with a 50-point lead over anybody. Yeah. Oh yeah. And yeah, so, yeah. like, could he blow that? Sure. I mean, right. you know, we've seen crazier things happen, but I doubt it. Um, now, DeSantis is a strong candidate and, and has a lot of things that people like about Trump um, uh, and without some of the things people don't like about mm-hmm. Trump. Um, so there's an interesting kind of uh, uh, combination there, and I think people really like that. Um, the thing is, just like we've seen in every election cycle for as long as I can remember, there's some up-and-coming hot candidate that has a shot to make a run. And sometimes they decide to go for it in that year, and sometimes they don't. Barack Obama went for it, right? Mm -hmm. He was only in the Senate for, what, a year and a half before he announced his candidacy. He went for it. He got it. Um, Chris Christie, back in, was it 2008, 2012, whatever that was, didn't go for it. And decided to stay, and I'm, I'm going to wait one more term. And when he, by the time he ran, no one cared, yeah. right? Yeah. You have one op- opportunity here almost all the time. There's a, maybe a little bit of a room here. If, if DeSantis were to become the vice president, then obviously he'd be the obvious candidate in 2028 if, if Trump were to, have, were to win. But, like, there's, there's a personal calculation here for DeSantis as well. He, the guy probably wants to be president of the United States one day. He may or may not have a multiple opportunities. You're, you, you come and you go here. Yeah. I mean, look at, like, you know, I can, I'm old enough to remember a year ago when everybody on, on the conservative media was talking about how Christy Noem was the most fantastic <laughs> candidate of all time, and I haven't heard her name in six months. Right. You know, this, the, 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 this is a, a fickle crowd, mm-hmm. a fickle crowd. So at some point, this, this, there has to be some... Um, if DeSantis wants it, which he has not clearly said yet, but no. I think he does, and I, I think Trump is at 99% from every one of his aides, at some point these guys are going to get in a race against each other and there's going to be some fireworks. There's no reason to rush it, right. but like, if they do want to go for this, DeSantis has just as much a right as anybody else to step into this race and say, I think I should be the guy. Yeah. And here's why I think I should be the guy, as does Donald Trump. And we can't just be this... this. He's not betraying the country. He's not betraying the country by running for president or not agreeing with every single thing. The one thing that, that seems to have some credibility behind all this, or at least maybe does, is that Ron DeSantis, of all the rumored 2024 uh, nominees, is the one guy who hasn't publicly said, if Donald Trump runs, I won't. Mm-hmm. He's, he's the only one who hasn't said that publicly. A lot of these other candidates have said it. Now, you might as well say it because, number one, if you reverse yourself, no one seems to care about these things anyway. <laughs> and number two, like if he, if he runs and, 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 and he's in the race, you're probably without a chance of winning. Yeah. So you're probably not going to go anyway. DeSantis might be the one guy who could change that calculus, though. And, and look, if he thinks he, should be, if he could be the president of the United States and be the best president for this country, he should consider running, just like Donald Trump should. Yeah, John. I'm not against President DeSantis. I don't like, though, that a lot of people who have been propping him up have been doing so because anytime we see an example of like competent right wing leadership, we're like, this guy's got to be the president. Yeah. And it's like, yeah, right it's now, which I think was the Christy Nome thing that mm-hmm. you referred what, to. We're like, oh my God, it's a woman. She's not who's even a Republican. She's not even competent either. Like, well, I didn't even. She think seemed she was, like, to be, well, but she was very. She didn't do any restrictions. Right. right. She never did a mass man. She did a lot of things in that. 2020 era, like yeah. that era, like she was pushing back against the grain a lot. You know, places like Texas, famously, Abbott put on a mask mandate and stuff. Yeah. She didn't do any of that. So she had a lot of love then. Yeah. You yeah. know, yeah. but it, it's fickle. Yeah. And, and that's the thing, too, with like, so we need examples of state governments who are competent to hold other state governments who are like, you know, semi or incompetent accountable. So like, you know, Greg Abbott has a fire under him right now because of people like Ron DeSantis who are setting such a good example. So to throw him into the DC swamp and assume that he's gonna be just as effective is just not true. I mean, we don't even know what the presidency is. Like, you know, a presidency under like FDR is a lot different than a presidency under like, you know, Donald Trump or even one of these other people. So I think the reason that Trump needs to go to Washington is simply because of like what he represents 
sense as like a shock to that system. Mm -hmm. Maybe he's mm -hmm. effective, maybe he's not, but it's like if we put DeSantis in there, who's going to run Florida? You know, it, it's, it's just not going to go That's as well. Fair. Charlie Chris can do it. He's great. <laughs> I've also noticed that a lot of the people who were against Trump in 2016 are all of a sudden very pro DeSantis. And so I noticed that and it sets off mm. some alarm bells because, you know, you look at like what DeSantis is doing. Also, you know, if we're talking about like a proactive movement, too often what I think Republicans do is react, like, oh, uh, the left, they should stop doing this or stop. But then they're not necessarily setting agendas forward. Donald Trump did that. He said, we're going to build a wall. We are going to have our nation. We're going to bring back our jobs. You look at DeSantis, great guy. But what he's doing is reacting to only the most extreme examples of leftist policy. Critical race theory, teaching white kids to hate themselves, not in my state. Vaccine mandates, not in my state. And we're like, this is the guy who's going to carry the torch. And it's like, that's great. That's good that he's doing that. But is that like really the guy who's going to carry the torch, just reacting to the most extreme elements of the left marching down the field? I'm not so sure that that's the case. You know, DeSantis has kind of awoken this like populist sentiment about like, oh, we're going to break up the big tech monopolies and we're going to go after these big corporations. And it's like, that's not why Donald Trump... Donald Trump kind of set that fire, not because we're against big corporations, we don't like big tech, but because they're being weaponized against us. There was more to it than this sort of like abstract economic principle. It was because we're losing our country. And that's what I think the divide is between the Trump crowd and the DeSantis crowd when there's not overlap between the two. Okay. Is, is there another candidate you see outside of DeSantis that you think is the like outside of DeSantis and Trump? Is there another one that you see that no? That and and I actually I disagree with what you said too about not getting fixated on Trump. I am totally fixated <laughs> on Trump. Like he's my hero. I would do anything for that man. Like, not even joking. Um, I, but he decides not to run. There's Are no, you, he's, uh, he's running. Yes. But like let, yeah. let's say he decides not to run. Or something. God forbid. Who, something or how happens. About this? Who do you right? want him to pick as VP? Do you yeah. have a name that you think is exciting? Not particularly, because anyone who I, like, Mike Pence I thought was good because I didn't know who he was. And, you know, I thought he did a good job for a while as Trump's vice president, because I think, frankly, the only important political virtue is, like, loyalty. So I want someone who's going to be loyal to Trump. Trump's biggest problem was that he was didn't have people around that's, him who were loyal. That is true. So the I would be afraid of, of picking issues. up someone like a DeSantis or, like, maybe a, a Josh Hawley or something, just because I want those people to stay where they are, because I think they do good work. Mm -hmm. So I would... I, there's no one that I could think of other than DeSantis. Mm -hmm. That would really ignite people. I wouldn't want the to take the Sanders out of Florida. Be. I would maybe. Well, I mean, I yeah, I I say this with the idea that Florida could still be run by someone just as good as him. I don't yeah, know who don't that know. would be, yeah. right? Yeah. But I, you know, it's I mean, a, I, America. I don't know if you've noticed, John, but America's in big trouble. Also, so we need is, someone. What do we really mean by vice president? What do we really like need? <laughs> like, oh, in case the president can't serve two terms. What about term limits? I mean, what are these ideas? <laughs> we, well, the guy's like 100 years old almost. Right, and right. Eventually, and he's going to need to be replaced. I don't think he's going to... We're going to get Elon Musk <laughs> to upload his consciousness <laughs> okay, right, to, to this governing robot. You have an answer for everything, And Jeff. it's going to be great. And, you know, it's we're going to have like our... Robot. I'm not against social credit scores either, but uh -huh. we're going to have one like we have in America. You know, so instead of like a Chinese one, we're going to have Patriot points in America. And it's like, you <laughs> you said Trump looked like a Cheeto. Minus 100 Patriot <laughs> points. Oh, <my> gosh. <laughs> Uh, all right, just so you know, in case John ever runs for office, this is the That's a joke. that he wants. But, you know, That's a joke. Do you get, Hurry up, it is I have a joke. to go to break. Do you get those what? emails from Trump? It's like, you know, we're triple matching Patriot points if you donate. <laughs> yes, just, yes. That was the joke. Uh, I don't think Stu gets emails from Trump, though. All right, we got to go to break. lots Patriot points, Sarah. <laughs> but first, we're going to thank our sponsor, Omega <laughs> XL. So um, here was my problem earlier, for those of you who watch every day uh, earlier this week, when I, like, literally could not move. Um, I, I was out of Omega XL and I kept meaning to order more and I didn't. And, um, I look, I'm just saying I was fine when I was taking it. And when I was not taking it, I got hurt. So that's all That's all that I'll say. But Omega XL is uh, is there for those of you who maybe you live in constant pain, maybe you have arthritis, uh, maybe you're just like, you're like me and you're the age where lifting your child uh, on and off of your shoulders can actually just injure you like you're paralyzed. Yeah, that's, I'm, I'm that age. I'm, <laughs> I'm that many years old. Um, whatever the case may be, how, why, why, how you have your pain, Whatever the case may be, you got to try Omega XL. It is essential fatty acid combination, and uh, it reduces the inflammation in your body. That uh, oftentimes you don't realize it's the inflammation that's causing the pain. So you can do all of these things, put on all these topical creams. It's just going to mask the issue. Don't mask the issue. Just get to the root of the problem with Omega XL. All right. Order a bottle of Omega XL now. Get a second bottle for free over at omegaxl.com/news. That is omegaxl.com/news.
Okay, I want to get back to 2024 for a second because I think the the most fascinating uh, part about that is that now the Democrats, all that we're hearing is that the Democrats are talking about Hillary Clinton coming back. I These are the reports, it. right? You don't buy it? I don't buy it. Because because if if that is the case, I am bring Trump back, please. <laughs> I am Trump all Clinton in. Too? Again, God, that's that what insane. that's what this country deserves, honestly. It is a hundred percent what this country deserves. <laughs> I will fully agree with you to on that. To have to go through all of that again yeah. and all of the coverage and just, it, it, I, I really think that that's, it's what we need. You know, I th I don't think so. I don't think it's going to happen, right? I, I, I She, I think, wants the attention and she correctly recognizes that no one will, until she says no right. definitively, um, people will still talk about her. And so she'll she can get keep going on to programs. She'll go on to programs. And, she'll, yeah. People will listen to her podcast to see if she mentions anything. Right. You know, all that stuff goes on. You know, I think one of the things that's weird about um, uh, the the left and, like, you know, former candidates, like Trump, for example, I think look, a lot of people look at Trump and say, okay, we want him to come back because we know he could beat, you know, whoever the, 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 the candidate on the left was. That's not how the left looks at Hillary Clinton. They look at her as someone who failed against a candidate she should have easily beaten. Mm -hmm. I'm not saying that's the correct way to look at it, but that's how they look at it. They look at it as the biggest miss opportunity in history where it should have been an easy walk into the White House and she blew it. Now, yeah. again, is that the correct way of looking at this? Probably not, but that's the way they look at it. Right. So I don't think they, they don't, they look at her, I think, in a way, the same way the right looks at like a Mitt Romney, where they look at him and be like, how did you not win that? Mm -hmm. Like, really, in the middle of all that, you fail? You suck. Go away. I think that's the way the right feels about Romney. I think that's the way the left feels about Clinton. I, if she did run, I don't think she would win the nomination. But uh, I just don't. I think she's. I, I don't Who think, do they have, though? Well, Gavin Newsom. Yeah, you Newsom's one, so I think. You think? I am afraid of him because he's a good-looking guy, he's charismatic, and, uh, you know, as much as these these coalitions would like to, you know, talk about how much they love, like, you know, uh, POC, LGBT, like, <laughs> if you have, like, a straight, young, white guy up there who's, like, good-looking and, like, preaching socialism to the masses, like, that's what's going to get these people out to vote. And I he's think that... run California into a... Sh and do you think they know that? <laughs> when have they ever held themselves accountable for their ideas? They, I mean, they literally, it's, it's the same reason why they all like therapy so much, because it can never fail. It's like, oh, you just simply didn't go to enough therapy if you're mm -hmm. still messed up. You just simply didn't do leftism hard enough if it's still like messed up. <laughs> they fair. have no accountability. So, and, and because he's young, I think that he could really spar with somebody like, uh, like Donald Trump, for example, um, if it were to come down to that, because I don't know who else. I mean, Hillary Clinton, maybe just because she has such good name recognition, but it can't be Kamala because yeah. she's the most off-putting person in American politics. Joe Biden, that guy's a hologram. So, like, who do they have <laughs> left? I know. It, I really am, like, fascinated by how they, they have no bench whatsoever. Of course, we just spent uh, the, the last segment talking about who, who the hell we even have. Trump. Well, I know, but I'm saying, like, but... but uh, we don't really have a bench either, I guess. Not a deep one. You know, I think there's some good people. I mean, I, look, you know, I think there's been The a way you started that was like, eh, <laughs> yeah, well, no, I think I there's mean, a guy or two. It's not I very just, compelling. Yeah, no, I mean, I, look, I, 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 it's, it's part of this is just looking at, you know, there's a constant hero search, I think, going on. Yeah. You know, where you, you want to find this magical person. I think John's found his uh, with, with, with our former president. <laughs> Literally, yes. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but, like, I, you know, I think that that's sometimes a difficult thing to do. You know, it's nobody's perfect. Nobody, nobody hits at, out of the park all the time. Mm -hmm. You know, some of these candidates, I think, would be good presidents. But, like, there's a lot more to it than that, right? Like, it's not just who runs the government best. It's who campaigns best, who does the best job on television, who's able to keep an organization together. Um, you know, Donald Trump kind of mixed all that stuff up. But you see, going back into, uh, you know, past races, and uh, when they become more conventional, when you're used to sort of the dynamic of a race, a lot of that stuff comes back into play. And, you know, I don't know. I mean, like, you know, Ron DeSantis has won one race. He won it in a very close race mm -hmm. uh, in a purple state, which is really hard to do. And I think he'll I think he'll be reelected uh, in Florida. I think he'll be, you know, the easily is, Christ, is he the guy that's actually going to get that nomination? Yeah. Um, you know, I think he'll win that probably yeah. pretty easily. But the, you're right. The, it's, you know, like people like Holly, people like some people like Tom Cotton. Um, you know, there's certainly some of those people who have run before will probably try it again. A lot of this has to do with Trump, though. If Trump says he wants it, it's basically his. He'll clear the field, save for probably one or two people. You'll probably get someone 
you know, from the Larry Hogan wing of the party, mm -hmm. someone who's going to bring us back to, uh, you know, moderate republicanism. Uh, maybe you get one or two other challengers. You know, I think I, one thing that's interesting maybe to this table is I think Trump has opened himself up to someone from who's more skeptical on vaccines than he is. Right. Um, you know, he is him. His constant sort of like, uh, look, yeah, John. What? <laughs> uh, so, so, you know, his kind of his kind of promotion of this and standing by the vaccines and talking about getting a booster and somewhat being critical of DeSantis huh. for not talking about that. What did he call? He called uh, he said gutless. Yeah, gutless uh, politicians yeah. who won't admit if they got it or not. Yeah. You know, I think there is I don't know who that person is. But my thought was and we talked to him the other day was Rand Paul where you could see a guy who's been mm -hmm. um, really, he's been kind of leading yep. that sort of skeptical part, that, on beating Fauci. up on Fauci yep. and stuff. You could see, I think, that relating to some, though it's a much different wing of, of the party than, than Trump is from uh, on all other things. Mm -hmm. So I don't know if that's the exact right fit, but I, I, I kind of feel like there will be a couple of other challengers, but no one's going to make a dent in Trump. I mean, Trump, I think, sails to that nomination if he wants it. Yeah, John, I will, I will give you a 30-second rebuttal. There's no rebuttal. I was my other, if not Trump, my like succeeding fantasy. You know, I don't think that we should go back to like politicians for at least another decade. Like, I would love to see like a Gibson 2028 run. Like Mel Gibson, can you imagine that? <laughs> that's an un that's like an unironic opinion of mine. Like, I would like to see or a Vince McMahon or something oh, like that. Oh no! Like Donald Trump basically turned like the presidency into like WWE. It was so great to watch because I was in I was into WWE when I was a teenager, oh, and then I got geez. into politics, and the transition was fluid because it was like. <laughs> Now I'm you've sure got Trump in there. It was yeah, great. Yeah. If we get a WWE, we should get an actual wrestler that looks like at any point he could just walk over and just tear the podium up That'd in the great. middle of the debate. That's yeah. what you need. Yeah. Well, I, I mean, we had Linda McMahon ran. Was that? Were you excited yeah. about that? <laughs> yeah. Were you no, into the Linda so McMahon much. candidacy in Connecticut? Well, no, but for a different. I, I mean, I'm not the hugest <laughs> McMahon fan in general, but if you had like, uh, uh, who'd be a good wrestler that'd be a good president? I mean, everyone talks yeah, about The Rock, right? Keep, CM Punk, actually. Mm -hmm. CM Punk radicalized me on free oh speech. Gosh, they had this whole story arc in, like, 2011 where he was speaking truth to Vince McMahon, who was, like, running the company uh, the company incompetently, and he was, like, cutting his mics off and everything. And I'm, like, 11 year old, years old watching this. I'm like, censorship is wrong. And it, like, really, no, seriously, like, it <laughs> woke something up inside yeah. of me that's just never gone out. That's All right, very cute. There we go. <laughs> right. So, Trump, Punk. 2024? Well, his real name is Phil Brooks. But. Okay. So, <laughs> you don't think he was He's also a total, like, like progressive, which we'll fix that. Oh, okay. yeah. You need, to, you need to work on that first, John. All right. We got to take a break. We'll be back. <laughs> no, I am very curious, though, like, what your thoughts are on Trump constantly coming back. I really do feel like he Uh, apparently, there's a new milestone over at the New York Times. Uh, they have referred to women as menstruators. This is the first time ever in the New York Times uh, in a Thursday article yesterday on changing attitudes towards feminine hygiene products. Uh, so that nowhere did they say uh, they used feminine pronouns. Um, they did not use the words w woman or female at any point in the article. And uh, they only said girls in reference to two specific girls that the New York Times interviewed for the piece. Um, so they say people, they say young people, uh, they make all of these you know, weird turns to make sure that they didn't say women, female, uh, feminine pronouns, and then of course refer to them as menstruators, which Obviously, it's the first three letters of that word. Problematic. Is men. Mm -hmm. So very. And so. men seems to be in women too. So right. Uh, for all in, of in these, multiple different all of this ways. is very problematic. Yes. Um, so yeah, this is a, uh, a a bizarre one. I mean, I don't know that this is like a statement that they're never going to use the word women again. I mean, it is a story about feminine products. Uh, so it may, like, it, it's almost the reverse. Like, it's not that they di they are using menstruators for the first time. It's that they're not using women along with a story Correct. about menstruation. Correct. Um, so, so, right, because this is not the first, like, the other things that they've done, you know, chest feeding right. and uh, birthing person <laughs> and, uh, oh, they've even said um, vagina owner. Vagina. Can you can you lease to own? I don't know. I don't know how that. I don't know works. how it works either, Stu. Exactly. And I have one. Yeah. So okay. are you renting? Or what's, I am what's your not renting. Okay. No, right. no, well, no, no space available. Yeah, because interest rates are low, so you can. It's a good time to open up a new lease. Um, I, I don't. I, it's just a weird thing, right? I mean, it yeah. doesn't make much sense. And uh, 
the, looking at the conversation about this, like, you know, the, I was reading something about the, uh, we're going to do something on this tonight on Studios America, but like the, the whole Leah Thomas swimming situation where, you know, they now are saying that maybe she threw the race against the other transgender swimmer mm. to show that she could lose. Um, and that was such a weird headline, too. It's so weird. The whole thing is just, it's like, it's impossible to follow. I know. I can't even understand the stories. <laughs> like, they, when, especially when they start calling individuals they. Yeah. And I really don't get it. But what, one of the things that's kind of at the front of that, and all of this gender stuff from the beginning, is there's, there's this accusation from people like the New York Times that conservatives, uh, you know, people on the right, there's hate there, right? Mm -hmm. Like the reason why we talk about this is not because we care about women's sports and the competition level. It's because we hate anybody that's different than right. us and we're just complaining about it all the time. But it's like, and I did not know this until today, um, but there was a, uh, th there is a, the first non-binary Olympic athlete is going to be in the Winter Olympics. Did you oh, know this? Oh, no, I didn't. Um, she, uh, I, he, I, they uh, <laughs> are uh, going to be a, in, the, in the couple's skating situation. So you've got a, 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 a woman, okay. a, a menstruator, okay. on one side, <laughs> and then on the other side is, um, <laughs> is a non-binary person. But what are they really? A man. Okay. So, okay. so it still is a woman and a man. Right. Okay. It's a woman and a man. Right. But she's saying she's non-binary. So in their eyes, it's not a woman and a man, right? It's a woman and a they. Okay. My point to this, though, is have you heard one conservative get all up in arms about it? No. And of course, the answer to that is no. We don't care at all. It doesn't change the competition right. level of the event. Right. Right? Like, it, it, is, it is a guy and a girl in, a, in an event that is normally a guy and a girl, and the guy seems, with a beard, by the way, seems to think that they're a they. And whatever. They're a they. They're a they. I know people get pissed off when you don't care about this stuff, but it's like, I, I don't care about ice skating at all, right. so it's really hard for me to get up in arms. The bottom line, though, is that no, I don't care about swimming either, yeah. but there is a line there for the actual sport and taking women out of, of these competitions and ruining their athletic careers when it's not ruining their athletic career. I don't hear one person on the right up in arms about it. Yeah, that's a great point, John. This is what 100 years of feminism does. I mean, it started because they thought that they could be more than women, and then they've totally like erased what it even means to be a woman. I mean, mm -hmm. they said women are more than their vaginas. Now they literally are just reduced to you menstruate. You have a vagina. Vagina owner. And it just comes right back to, to bite them, I guess. Yeah. Um, it's a really sad time that we're living in. All right. Uh, we got to take a break. We'll be back. I feel like... They have 48 more places now. 2.95% uh, <laughs> uh, if you have good credit. Uh, Hong Kong officials, I just really quickly before we have to go, this just want to throw this at you. Hong Kong officials will destroy 2,000 hamsters, chinchillas, and other small animals after tracing a coronavirus outbreak to an employee at a pet shop where 11 hamsters in the shop tested positive. Oh, the store's called I Love Rabbit? Isn't that so sad? Miss oh, Rabbit? Miss Rabbit? Yeah, so they're just like, yeah, no, they're, we're, we're destroying uh, the animals because they have coronavirus, so they must have been the ones uh, who, who gave the virus to the humans. And here is a picture of people with, like, their animals in baggies giving their animals to the government, I'm told. This is hamster, hamster this side is, right here. It's like Stalin said, one dead chinchilla <laughs> is a tragedy. <laughs> 2,000 dead chinchillas is a, is a statistic. <laughs> I really, I, I can't, this is very sad to me. It's. I keep thinking about it. The poor hamsters. But I did, I am a, a previous rat pet owner. So I have a hamster, owner. Nibbles. That's um, right, Nibbles. As well as a, uh, a skinny pig, uh, George. Oh, George. And this is very offensive to my household. Right? It's, it's guinea side. What would you do if Nibbles or George, you found out, did have coronavirus? Uh, that's a good question. I would not be performing a test to find out, so I would never <laughs> okay. know. Yes. Okay, yeah, that's, that's <laughs> Maybe actually that's where we're fault. getting it from. Maybe it's all been rodents this whole time. This whole time. Yes. We, in that case, we own an apology to China. Yeah, I do. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just kidding. No, we don't. Uh, also, don't forget to, uh, to catch myself and this guy over here, John Doyle, uh, on You Are Here. I believe it's right after this program. So you can catch that if you are watching Blaze TV. Um, you, it's on YouTube, streamed on YouTube. You can catch that tonight. We'll see you there. Thanks, guys. <laughs>